leak that led to the resignation of Her Majesty's Ambassador to Washington. And what we're particularly keen on hearing is both the importance of secure and candid communications between an ambassador and uh, the Foreign Office and the Foreign Secretary, uh, but also the importance of uh, uh, having the right people and, and supporting the people in post. And I was wondering if you could focus your responses on those areas. That would be extremely helpful. Of course. Pretty, you want to start? Thank you, Chair. Lord Haig. You were Foreign Secretary at the time, back in June 2013, when the Snowden leaks and all the documents were published um, from the National Security Agency. Now, at that stage, you also gave a statement to the House of Commons in terms of the link between those links and GCHQ zone implications as well, those connections. In your experience, how damaging are leaks to the availability of, or the ability of government to actually carry out its core functions? And also, how damaging was that leak in particular between the UK and US relations? Well, the Snowden um, leaks, revelations, allegations, whatever we want to uh, uh, call that mixture of um, documents, um, was very damaging, but it was very damaging to Western security. Uh, it was damaging in a quite different way from the um, uh, leaks that you've been focused on in the, in the last couple of weeks. Um, it didn't damage the ability of British government and British diplomacy to function and to give frank advice uh, to each other in any way. After all, it didn't originate within the United Kingdom system. Uh, nor would I say that it damaged relations between the United States and the United Kingdom. This was uh, from within the US system. It was a very awkward matter for the United Kingdom. Um, but there was no point having recriminations over that. We had to face the problems that raised together. So it raised major problems for the national security of Western nations, but it didn't damage the um, integrity of our own system of communication and uh, government. Can I ask, just on a systems, uh, it's more of a systems and a process question, really. How did the Foreign Office support you in terms of responding to that situation, the dialogues that you were having with counterparts? Uh, over the Snowden? Yes, uh, the Snowden. Well, very well. As, as you say, it, um, it required a statement, to the, I would say one of the trickiest statements I've ever made to the House of Commons, because it's particularly tricky to uh, refute things you don't admit are credible allegations in the first place, and to... Uh, you know, it was very tricky uh, to comment for hours in the House of Commons on uh, matters of intelligence rather than to the uh, ISC. Um, so they gave me uh, extensive, very extensive support, and that, as did uh, GCHQ, and they're well equipped to do that. And so coming back now to the recent leak in Washington, um, or around Sir Kim Darroch's um, communications there. How significant do you think that most recent leak has been? And applying that to your previous experience as Foreign Secretary, I guess you know, I'm asking you now a range question in terms of the scale of significance and how do you think the reaction and the response has since been? Well, it is significant. I don't think we had anything on that... Um scale, certainly nothing that caused any um, a row of anything like that dimension in the time I was Foreign Secretary or in the term of most modern Foreign Secretaries. Um, so I didn't have experience of um, dealing with something comparable to, to this recent leak. It is significant because it has turned out to set a whole series of unfortunate precedents, very damaging precedents. Um, one that you can, in effect, politically assassinate one of Her Majesty's ambassadors. Can you envision uh, yeah. other heads of state, perhaps less friendly nations, using a similar technique of blanking a British ambassador and seeking to get them removed? Well, I can imagine them being rather more emboldened to do so in the future now after this, because the uh, you know I mentioned one precedent was that you can somebody. Uh, can politically assassinate an ambassador. Another is that um, it set the precedent that uh, the head of state of another country, albeit a um, friendly country, um, has joined in making an ambassador's position untenable. That's a very bad precedent. Uh, Can you imagine another head of state replicating it perhaps in Moscow or... 
Well, you could imagine a whole range of uh, situations uh, in which that could arise, where we have differences, where ambassadors, for good reason, have differences with um, the head of state of the host country. You know, and we sometimes have, for instance, ambassadors who are supporting the work of the International Criminal Court, but the uh, government of that country is most uncomfortable about its proceedings, for instance, um, as well as countries that are, uh, which have a, a more adversarial military posture to the United Kingdom. So, uh, yes, I can imagine that uh, on a greater scale. In the will future. it mean that the UK government will now have to be more robust uh, in defending uh, our envoys, both civilian and, of course, military as well, uh, to avoid this becoming a norm? Well, I think we should be robust. I mean, we should be in principle, anyway. I, I can't think of any organization, company, country, which can benefit from um, hanging out to dry an official who is doing their job. Uh, and what is more in doing their job? Telling the truth, as they are meant to do. That cannot be beneficial in the long term to any organization. And it's wrong in principle to uh, treat them in that way. Um, it's important, therefore, to be robust. And I, I would suggest that, um, given that there is to be a new prime minister next week, and no doubt making their dispositions in the cabinet, this will be a good moment to make clear um, from the very top that public servants are expected to give frank, honest, clear, clearly expressed advice and that the government will always seek to ensure they're never penalised for, for doing so if they're put in a difficult situation as a result of doing so. So Lord Hay, just on that point, if, you, if this had happened on your watch as Foreign Secretary, would you be calling for certain measures or changes across Her Majesty's ambassadorial network or within the Foreign Office? Um, in terms of advice on communications or anything of that nature. And would there be, would, could you envisage a situation where you would be saying to permanent secretary in the department that we fundamentally need to take a review of what has gone on and what type of advice do you, could you imagine yourself that you'd be asking for? Well, I think I would be reluctant to um, reorganise the entire system. Um, over um, what are very damaging but still a small number of incidents. And you don't necessarily know that reorganising the system will uh, solve the problem anyway, given that the main determinant of whether there are leaks from any organisation is the, the extent of the common culture and common pride of that organisation. You know, there are, we know examples in history of huge numbers of people keeping vast secrets for, for decades, you know, Bletchley Park, even beyond the point where it was strictly necessary to do so. And yet we, all of us who've been involved in politics, know of many cases where you can get a very small number of people in a room and uh, you still have a lot of leaks because they don't have a common culture. Or, uh, so that is the main thing. Everything else is a second or third line of, uh, of defence. However, clearly now there is a need for more of that second line of defence and that to me involves increasing the disincentives to uh, leak. And I would be asking, if I was there now, of what more can we do to ensure we can catch anybody who leak, if, that in, if it is a leak rather than a, um, a hack uh, of some kind. Um, and also then reiterating the point I made uh, a moment ago, that a disincentive to, uh, for this kind of behavior is the knowledge that the government of the day will robustly stand by whoever is targeted by it. Chris, do you want to come in and ask me? I just wonder, in relation to that last point, um, because Donald Trump's initial tweet was what it was and followed up by a second round, um, when um, two days later uh, Kim Darrick had said that he was going to go and that that had been accepted by the government, Donald Tr Trump said, well, I wish him well and, and people have shown me that he actually said lots of nice things about me as well. Now, leaving aside the kind of petulant childishness of, of, the, of, of those reactions by Mr Trump, I just wonder whether we shouldn't have held firmer for longer. Well, I would have thought so, although, of course, in this case... Um 
so Kim Darroch, as I understand it, chose to resign. Uh, and so, uh, and, and for understandable reasons, he thought he could no longer do his job and the embassy was being affected in how it did its work. But um, yes, had I been in government, I would have favoured um, holding out against that pressure, partly because of the terrible precedent that it sets for the future, whatever the short-term cost uh, yeah. over the days that followed. And, and I understand Jeremy Hunt and Sir Simon MacDonald, both of them tried to say, no, we don't want to, and, and maybe the Prime Minister as well, I think, tried to say that they didn't want to accept Sir Kim's um, resignation. But, but, but by that moment, we'd, we'd not held strong enough, had we, in truth? Well, no, although I don't know... Um uh, the committee might know more than I do about the um, internal um, uh, workings, and you may have asked more about that over those uh, days last week. But um, personally, I would have preferred everybody to stand united around a, uh, a clear line of the ambassador carries on, including the ambassador. And just one other thing. I, we've, we've said on this committee, as Simon MacDonald asked, we asked him whether he could remember any other a non-friendly nation that had behaved in a similar way, and he said no. Um, I just wonder whether, in a way, it was even odd, it was more difficult for us because it was a friendly nation, because if you have a very capricious figure at the head of a very friendly nation, everybody else wants to sort of dance to that tune, and then in the end you find that the tune has moved on and you're left... My, my mixed metaphor's gone very wrong now, but you get the drift of what I'm saying. I just wonder whether it's even more difficult when you have a very capricious um, president of the United States. It is more difficult. Uh, we've certainly had difficulties over ambassadors before, but usually in the sense of uh, arguing about the initial um, agreement for them. Mm -hmm. you know, I had that uh, difference with uh, Iran, I think, in, in 2010, 2000, and 11, where they didn't want to accept our nomination as an ambassador and asked for somebody different. And uh, we said, no, this is our nominee. We choose the ambassador. And if you don't want our ambassador, we won't want your ambassador anymore. And you can take a um, tougher line in those situations. But I think we have to be pretty robust, even with friendly countries, for the greater good and for the long term. You mentioned Agrimont there. Would you agree that, uh, given the highly political nature of some ambassadorial posts and the changing nature of government in the United Kingdom, that uh, some form of pre-appointment meeting with Parliament would be a wise idea to ensure that the representation of the British people is done across the spectrum? I'm not sure I managed to sign away any of the prerogatives of government while I was in it, so I better not start doing so. Oh, well, well, now, well, now that you've left, it's the perfect moment to do, to, it, uh, yes. to do so uh, now. But um, I, th I think that's, that's going to have to be a question for future foreign secretaries and prime ministers. Mm -hmm. Royston, you wanted to come in? Uh, I'd, I'd like to just talk about the leak. Well, not the leak itself, but the severity of the leak. So there were leaks and there were leaks, and this one was sick significant in the way that it brought down the ambassador. So from your experience, because it may have changed of course, are all leaks in the Foreign Office investigated in the same way and as robustly? I mean the answer is probably no, but what, what are the differences between them and how is that prioritised? Well the answer is no and on this particular aspect of it I'm, I'm not sure I'm that helpful uh, to the committee as a witness because we honestly didn't have many I'm struggling to remember serious leaks from the Foreign Office in the time I was Foreign Secretary. There was absolutely the, um, the Snowden leaks on a different scale, but from, uh, from the United States uh, itself. Um, but I've some experience serving on the National Security Council and in the Cabinet for a while of leaks across government. And um, no, the answer to, to the question is no, they vary greatly and they vary depending on the the impact made, the precedent set, not necessarily the subject matter concerned. This was not a leak after all of secret information um, and uh, you would normally expect a leak of secret or top secret information to be treated more seriously than um, sensitive information. Um, but given the um, what I was referring to earlier, the terrible precedent set in several respects and the need to um, 
avoid it being easy in future for this behavior to be repeated, it's quite appropriate to treat this very seriously. And how would, um, as the Foreign Secretary, because I don't really know what the reporting chain is, you know, I was talking to um, some witnesses we had last week about how someone might get this information out and then into the public domain. You know, my question, which was naive, I think, perhaps, is that when someone sees something on a screen, they only have to take a picture of it, but apparently you, some of these things are so sensitive, you wouldn't be allowed in a room with a telephone, for example. So there, there are all sorts of, um, as, as, I'm, as, as, as was explained to me, but there are all sorts of ways of doing this, and I, I just wonder how it comes to you as Foreign Secretary, and then when there's a leak of this magnitude, being sensitive, not top secret, I understand that, but how does that affect your ability to do your job as Foreign Secretary if you feel that some of this information could, could and is being compromised? How does the information, how does the, um, this type of um, reporting from an ambassador come to the Foreign Secretary? Yeah. Was that, yeah. yeah. Well, that is um, very routine, every day. Foreign Secretaries vary in how they do their work because we all vary in how we like to take in information. Some have more briefing meetings, some read bigger piles of documents. I was very much in the latter camp. I liked to spend my evenings as uh, Foreign Secretary going through as many intelligence reports as possible because I had an appetite for that and all the dip tells from the embassies um, or at least to read the summary paragraph of all of them and then decide what more to read. Um, so it comes to you in your um, red box uh, if you do that at night or in the brought onto your desk during the day and um, certainly in my times, only a few years ago, was printed out. So it's an actual physical pile of those dip tells. And that, of course, means anybody in your private office has to be um, reading those things and preparing them for you, maybe commenting on them ahead of you reading them. Um, so that, that's the form in which it comes to the foreign sector. And it may be brought to you anywhere in the country or, depending on its classification, anywhere in the world um, as you travel around the world. Uh, how, so the, sorry, the second part of the question was... Um, how that, if, if you felt that um, information was likely to be or was always potentially can be compromised, how would it affect your ability to do your job? Well, as then it would affect the information. You know, if, if the people if writing these um, reports from around the world thought that it could easily be uh, compromised, well, then it would change their behaviour and then it would reduce the value to the, to the reader. Uh, because what you, if you're going to read that many reports from embassies and consulates around the world in a day, you really want crisp, clear, well-expressed, frank advice. You know, a lot of it is about situations more dire than a dysfunctional White House. It is saying, you know, there could be a civil war in country X. We're close to revolution here. These ministers are corrupt, whatever, you know. And you don't want these things hinting at. You want them to be um, clearly expressed. And, of course, many of those things, if they were published, would be pretty uh, enraging to the host government. So um, there isn't time going through hundreds of documents every day to say, well, I wonder what they meant by that. Uh, you really need to know that the ambassador in that country is giving you the, the information as they're giving it to you straight. Um, so it would be very serious if the, uh, if the system, if the, if the foreign office officials drafting dip tells, the ambassadors uh, writing them or amending them, worried about that if they if they changed their behavior because they thought it might regularly appear on them in the newspapers Ian you wanted to jump in may I just rewind Lord Haig just to an answer you gave before you said that um, the conclusion for the Sim, Sir Kim Darek in particular uh, is that and I think you said everyone should robustly stand behind whoever is targeted uh, in these kinds of leak situations um, I just wonder if I could ask you if you thought that the the fact that the former Foreign Secretary and favourite to be Prime Minister didn't do that, stand robustly behind Sir Kim Darek, um, affected the situation at all, and whether or not the actual resignation itself has set a dangerous precedent now that people think that leaking from the Foreign Office can get rid of someone they don't particularly like. 
Well, I certainly think it set a dangerous precedent, and of course there was also the resignation of Sir Ivan Rogers, and I know you, uh, you had him giving evidence to the committee. Um, it certainly sets a dangerous precedent, and yes, I do think it was, uh, let me say, most unfortunate that um, not all former foreign secretaries could give robust and unequivocal uh, support. Um, but there is an opportunity to put that right, um, as I say, there will be in some form a new cabinet uh, next week and uh, again I would suggest that's a good moment to uh, make clear how the British government will approach these things and to, to inform the civil service of how the uh, British government will approach these things. But it's regrettable if there is any equivocation about this. Mm-hmm. Are you waiting for the phone call for your old job back? <laughs> a phone call? For your old job back. I will not be, and if I received it, I know what reply. Uh, <laughs> giving, or for any to job to in government. <laughs> Bob, do you want to come in? Uh, the disincentives, uh, Lord Haig. Uh, are there any specific disincentives that you were thinking about? Are we talking about criminal prosecution? You talked about standing by the ambassador. Um, are you implying greater cyber protection? Is there more can be done for an organisational culture? So what sort of in- disincentives would encourage less leaking? I think, I think the biggest disincentive is um, uh, a high likelihood of being found out, um, almost irrespective of what the penalties are, as long as there are some serious penalties. Um, I don't think fiddling about with, um, you know, well, now you could have an extra six months in jail or now you could, uh, you know, lose not only your current job but a future one. They're, they're, Exposure and uh, the disgrace of that and the and career consequences of that would be a big uh, penalty and deterrent if people thought that was likely to happen. And so I think the... Now, I am not... I'm several years out of government, as the committee understands. There is a new, as I understand, new government information sharing system that came in over the last year. I'm not familiar with how that operates, but... For, to in the private sector now, in, um, in major financial institutions, for instance, if somebody sent sensitive data in an email to an external email address, you would almost certainly be able to find out who did it. And if somebody examined <coughs> an entire database, of um, you would almost certainly be able to work out who did that. You would expect to be able to, to do that. Now, that's not a 100% defence, because... Um, Photographs can be taken with phones, things can be printed out and put into envelopes, but nevertheless it ought to be possible to really narrow down uh, who could be responsible. And I don't know if the, um, you had the, um, with Simon MacDonald, the head of Foreign Office Security here, I think. Um, I don't know if they're able to do that or we'll, we'll do that in the course of this inquiry, but I would want to know if I was still in government can our system, do we have the functionality to do that? And if not, why not? And if not, when are we going to get it? But, but just on that point, you, you have two groups here. You have people within the Foreign Office of Government who have a very strong organisational culture yes. and you know, have a reasonable likelihood of being caught because they'll be on, probably on government systems. You then have SPADs and political appointees who may have taken documents with them once they had left their roles. And those people may still be encouraged to leak for other reasons and the disincentives may not work as well for that group. Is that a fair comment? Well, that, that's an interesting thought, although um, special advisers, political appointees, working with any such material should be only doing so on government systems, um, not putting it into any parallel system. And, and they should not be able to... Um, oh, sorry. No. But they'll have physical copies. So you, you mentioned physical copies. So they, they potentially could be taking pictures. Right. Of well, that, I suppose, is true. Although, of course, also in this case, there was a... Um, uh, part of this leak was quite... was very recent. Um, so, again, I, don't, I must not start uh, by proxy conducting this inquiry, but it didn't look like somebody who left, um, given the, uh, how recent some of the information was. Um, so um, many of the same considerations would apply, um, I think, and if there's any weakness in that connection in uh, the way special advisors work, certainly that would need 
put things right. They should be treated in the same way and be using the same systems as the civil servants. Lord Haig, could I press you on the question of the role of this committee? Um, because obviously there's a lot of ifs in this question, but if the EU relationship um, changes and if the relationship with the US becomes extremely important, um, do you think there is a role for, say, the top ten posts in the country for this committee to have some sort of you know, oversight or... Um, conversation or dialogue to meet those people. They do become very important and they do need to work in a political context. And I think in other countries you have a sort of a, you know, the US system of course is famous, but there could be a middle ground whereby I think the public could see who people are who will represent the UK in those important discussions. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be very, um I don't think it's a consequence of this leak and what we're talking about. That there may be wider arguments and other arguments for enhancing the role of this or other committees, but I don't think it necessarily arises from this uh, leak. And it's hard to oppose uh, more discussion and transparency in Parliament. But as you can sense in my response, I'm quite reluctant to say that um, parliamentary committees should in effect develop a veto over appointments made by the government. There is a case for that. They have that in the US Senate. But that is a different structure of uh, government. And so it, it's, um, you know, I wouldn't be um, instantly agreeing to that. But in any case, it's not my opinion on it that uh, that is going to matter. I agree that there are some diplomatic posts, like some civil service posts, that are so senior and have such political reach and I would argue the embassy in Washington, perhaps Paris, perhaps Moscow, uh, perhaps the UN, are of such political nature that they're not merely high-ranking officials, they're also envoys of this house and your house. Well, again, that's an interesting... They are Her Majesty's ambassadors. And uh, that implies they are there at, um, to represent Her Majesty and Majesty's government and, in effect, by royal prerogative. Um, so, and, of course, once you try to define which ones are important, you run into some interesting issues because, you know, when I used to read through that pile of um, details every day, yes, I would always read in full one from Washington or Paris, but I would also always read in full one from Mogadishu or Kabul or... You know, that there are places in the world where British ambassadors are in considerable danger day by day. There's that side. It's not all grand embassies in plush surroundings. There's a different side to the diplomatic service. It isn't as well, which you know, yes, you, Mr. Chairman, are aware of that. And um, they're very important postings. So um, I think it's quite hard to make the argument that um, you know that group are really important, uh, but the others could be. Could I not okay. argue this slightly differently and say there are some embassies, and Washington has, because it's in the news at the moment, has attracted this question in particular, which where the the appointment of the ambassador has begun to be politicised, that people are talking about effectively reforming the Test Act uh, of the 17th century uh, and, and adding a question of faith uh, into the appointment uh, of an ambassador. Would not approval from a parliamentary committee depoliticise and add a le level of protection to the envoy, who would then not only be sent by, as you rightly say, Her Majesty's Government, but also with the endorsement or approval, at the very least, of... Uh, a parliamentary body? Well, it might, but it might politicise the process as well, of course, um, particularly when appointed by a minority government. And um, you know, the pattern in this country is to have more and more hung parliaments and minority governments. So, um, and then you get a committee of a different composition from the government, and you can see where this might lead. So um, I'm neutral on this question, really, but I'm just giving, since you're giving some arguments, I'm naturally giving the arguments Absolutely. the being devil's advocate, but uh, I'm neutral on this and there are, argument. And, of course, there are other ways of doing it where you don't do approval, but at least you meet the three or four or five or whatever it is candidates. And so you haven't 
chosen. The, the, the choice is still for Her Majesty's Government, but the committee at least has had a, an input into the candidate process. Yeah, we have. I'm sorry. <laughs> Quite right. Okay, can I ask you, I mean, in light of the leaks that have happened, obviously, around Sakim Darak, and you know, from your experience as well, because you've held, held the incredible role of Foreign Secretary, did you, in your time as Foreign Secretary, ever have any concerns? Bear in mind you're reading those details every single night. You're seeing the state of the world. You're seeing highly classified, sensitive information, in addition to your place on the National Security Council as well. Did you have any concerns at any stage about the security of government communications and the materials that you were receiving? I think there is, if you're the Foreign Secretary or any of those um, uh, in a similar position in government, you are very conscious of the security of communications, or you should be, because it is all around you all the time. You know, you should be using only a government-approved mm. telephone for you, which is different from normal telephones if you're the Foreign Secretary. Um, you should be, on certain occasions, using a telephone from your home that is, um, you know, that has a higher level of security than any normal telephone. Uh, you're conscious that as you read through all these documents, they do have different classifications, and some are secret or top secret or sensitive, and then you have to keep in your mind those compartments because that affects who, with whom you can discuss what is in that document. Um, and you're also conscious that you are a physical vulnerability yourself in the system because, of course, um, wherever you are sitting with your pile of diptels and intelligence reports, you are the actual sitting there with the crown jewels of the, uh, uh, with a mass of sensitive information in one place. Um, although the fact the Foreign Secretary has um, close protection helps a lot with that, but um, you don't want to leave those red boxes open anywhere uh, in, in any hotel or embassy or even in your own home. So you, I think you're always conscious of that, that the, these, the, the many classifications, many different compartments and so on is, uh, always reinforces in your mind that this is quite tricky and sensitive. Um, and in my experience, private officers of ministers are very conscious of that too and reinforce that um, and uh, treat higher classifications of secrecy in a very, uh, very, very careful way. Um, so you are conscious of that. We didn't have, though, as I say, in that period um, from our own system any serious uh, consequential leaks. Um, they were all on the U.S. side at that time, including, of course, in 2010, 2011, the rather massive WikiLeaks, uh, leaks of U.S. diplomatic cables, which turned out to be uncomplimentary about the majority of governments in the world, including our own, or including the predecessor of the one I served in. And um, everybody just had to get over that, but very embarrassing to the United States. I think we were always conscious the same thing could happen to us, and it could on a bigger scale than anything we've seen so far. So can I just ask you, just in relation to obviously what happened in the US with WikiLeaks and obviously the Snowden papers too, of course at that time there was a lot of media noise around that, but obviously I'm assuming a degree of self-awareness um, and alertness within the UK government on the prospects of our systems being hacked, subject to cyber security testing. Were, were there more plans put in place? Do you recall your, your time in Foreign Secretary? Were there, were there more sort of um, plans or contingencies or preparedness put in place um, for those types of external risks and threats that could um, come, come to us? Well, that is a continuous daily um, battle. Um, cyber security, as, you know, as the committee will be aware, is something that, is, that doesn't sit still for a single day. Um, the threats, the malware, the activities of um, uh, foreign adversaries, both states and non-state actors, as we refer to them, uh, change and multiply every day. Um, so uh, that's part of what GCHQ does, is to help 
the government, as well as many organizations in the private sector, defend themselves against that, which means there is a constant uh, attention to that. I don't think a day would ever go by uh, without that. Um, and uh, there have been other, um, as I mentioned, uh, in more recent times, there has been a further upgrade and new system in uh, communications across government. So I don't think there has been any lack of attention to that. And what we're looking at here in this leak, of course, is not a systemic problem. Uh, let's hope it doesn't become one, but a, a targeted individual operation, which you can get whatever systems you put in place, um, although it shows, as we mentioned earlier, the disincentives to um, commit a breach of trust need to be raised if this is becoming more common. Can I ask on that? This is something we've seen occurring more frequently. In 2016, we saw in the Sunday Times a leak of um, one of Sir Kim's dip tells made it to the front page. We've recently seen leaks uh, from the National Security Council, which is particularly unusual, as you'll know in your mm -hmm. own experience. We've seen now a series of leaks, or in fact a large-scale leak from um, the um, from the embassy. Oh, sorry, from of embassy documents. Mm -hmm. This appears to be a cultural shift. This appears to be a tolerance of or an acceptance of that leaks may just be one of those things that happen. Is this a cultural problem that you think we can stamp on? Is this a cultural problem that is connected to uh, leadership in the organisation? Is this a cultural problem connected to the conflict between the FCO way of doing things and other ways of doing things? Do you, would you care to address any of those? I don't think it reflects a um, weakening culture uh, in the Foreign Office and other departments. Uh, of how to handle sensitive information. From what I can tell, again, I'm several years out of government, and I think there's a very positive side to that culture. Remember that um, amidst all this, these dangerous precedents and uh, unfortunate news, it, it's easy to forget that the great majority of public servants are going through their entire career mm -hmm. handling without fault a vast amount of sensitive or secret uh, information. And that is still the culture of um, the overwhelming majority of public servants in this country. And what goes with that is a culture of wide sharing of information. Um, and here I think it's very important to to be very reluctant to restrict more tightly the circles of um, to which sensitive information is uh, distributed in government because the culture of British government is details of this sort are shared not only throughout foreign office ministers but ministers in other departments, people on the National Security Council, therefore their private officers, their policy advisors. And it's one of the reasons why by comparison to many other governments in the world, British government, irrespective of party, is, is, believe it or not, generally more joined up than, uh, than others. That you're likely to hear a similar analysis and similar policy position from a British minister of a different department. And I can tell you, mating many other countries, including major friendly countries, sometimes you hear quite different thing from the defense secretary to the foreign minister to the head of state. So um, that's all part, it all goes with this culture of how you handle but also share sensitive information. And I think it's very important not to lose that. Um, and so uh, our efforts should be, what I would recommend, is a, um, an enhanced effort to defend the culture we've got rather than to so that culture's going now. I, I think it, it is, um, I suspect that the of the bitterness, the poison of the debate about Brexit in this country without, for this purpose, taking sides in that, that the, just the, the bitterness and the extent of that has increased the range of motives and opportunities to embarrass public officials. Um, and so we might be seeing the effect of that in what has happened to Sir Ivan Rogers and to Sir Kim Darragh. Um, and therefore, it's not necessarily an indication of a, of a um, deeper cultural 
change. It's just that we're in another moment of revolution. May I ask then, it, the protection of civil servants from political fallout would seem to be the essential answer to that cultural, that culture war, if you like. Would you agree? Well, I think that is an essential component of it, yes. I think there are two uh, essential components. One is to um, create the greatest possible likelihood that a leaker yeah. will be caught, or that the... the um, of course, it might be discovered that uh, it was highly unlikely to have been a leak and therefore was a hack or a cyber attack. That is also very important to establish because that puts a different dimension on these but things. But it's both detection uh, and support. And detection and support are the key things in my mind. Rather than reinventing another wheel, you know, um, regularly they go, over the years the government has reviewed classifications and uh, as the committee knows there was the, um, the end of the confidential class um, and things moved into official sensitive and so on um, you could change all of that around again or change the number of people who see a given document from 100 to 80 to 40 or whatever but these things probably wouldn't solve the problem detection and support are the key things to do in Sir Ivan Rogers' testimony, which I think was supported by the other two witnesses at the time, including Sir Peter Westmacott, um, they said that they had already somewhat changed their style of writing because they were aware of self-censorship for political reasons, but for security reasons. Uh, and although you were explaining in your, in your uh, past experience as Foreign Secretary that you were reading these details and hoovering up this information which was clearly put, they indicated they were already having to watch their, their words much more carefully and with certain things or almost be prepared to, to give a, a verbal briefing whilst at the same time of writing something in a slightly more tactful way mm -hmm. than they may say verbally. I mean, are you, were you aware of that and did you see that? Has that change happened since you were Foreign Secretary? No, I, I think we've always had <clears throat> quite a bit of that. Um, and yes, you had uh, Sir Peter Westmacott as one of your witnesses, and I've, I read his um, evidence, and I think he explained in there that um, he was often in the habit of writing a letter to the Foreign Secretary or to the uh, Prime Minister to go to a smaller number of recipients. And uh, that was his habit. He was ambassador to Paris and then to Washington when I was foreign secretary. Uh, that was a good habit. Um, uh, that really goes on top of and alongside the, um, the dip tells, the daily flow of information. I think you still need that. You still need the um, assessment of what is going on in a country to uh, be well distributed throughout the Whitehall system. And then, yes, if you're coming up to a... Um, uh, particular European negotiation, yes, you want specific advice in a more narrowly circulated letter from the uh, UK representative in Brussels. Or if the President of the United States is visiting shortly, you do want a letter from the ambassador in Washington that is only going to the top of the government about uh, specifically how to handle that, how to navigate that. So there has always been a role for such... Um, special and more um, narrowly circulated uh, letters. Um, I think the thing to guard against here is that becoming the normal practice, that um, taking over and the dip tells becoming an anodyne um, array of um, less interesting information because that would really devalue the whole system. Um, so I don't think that is a big recent change. I think um, experienced ambassadors in sensitive positions that are politically uh, uh, sensitive positions have to some extent always been doing that special extra bit of advice. Mm -hmm. Just to expand on what Mr. Celia just asked, um, given the anodyne nature of some of the communications that you may subsequently get for fear of leaks, um, is there a danger that overseas personnel could be put at risk in terms of the ambassadors having to send something to a senior government official and then deciding that either they don't because of fear of leak or they do and it's leaked and it puts their personnel that are overseas in harm's way? Well, it conceivably 
Yes, I think there is a greater risk that um, people just don't want to give the uh, full unvarnished information, that it just changes their habits just a little and makes people hold back when they're preparing to send information. Um, and that would be quite corrosive over time. Yeah, you could certainly see more extreme situations developing, but um, uh, these, this flow of information, these dip tells, do, do, are, do not normally um, go into details about the sources of information or about individual personnel in the diplomatic service. Um, so there's less of a risk that it puts individuals at physical risk. This is completely unfair because we've asked you here to talk about one thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to use the opportunity, if I may, very briefly. Um, there's going to be a new candidate for the International Monetary Fund, and I think it would be a bold Foreign Secretary who was confident that a Brit would succeed. Given that is unlikely to be the case, given our relationship with many of the appointing countries, would you agree that this may be an opportunity for global Britain to be properly global and to reinforce the international institutions uh, that have so often been dominated by Europe and the United States and perhaps support an important global democracy like India in having a place on one of the international bodies? Well, I don't think we should exclude that uh, possibility. Um, but uh, I, I don't think, uh, without knowing all the candidates, because of course once you name a specific country, you're often implying a specific candidate, um, uh, that it's, it's wise or helpful for me to uh, go into who should have it. But um, uh, Britain is certainly entitled to take its own global view, let's put it that way. Thank you very much. Lord Haig, thank you very much for coming at such short Thank notice. you. We're Pleasure. very grateful. Order, order. The